Hey everybody, this is Rabbit. Welcome to the channel. And today we're going to be looking at some beginner tips and tricks for War Thunder. Now, these are tips and tricks if you already understand the basics of movement, shooting, like how the game goes, but you find you're losing a lot of your gunfights and you're not really sure why. And we're going to look at basically ways you take out enemies and also ways that you know that enemies are in the immediate vicinity and how you can use these assets. And one other thing is, uh, this is going to be part one of a series, and the series and the other installments is going to go over sample engagements and sample fights where I go step by step through my thought process of why I'm doing the individual actions I'm doing, how I know enemies are there, and why I am responding to them in the way I am responding to them. So we're going to start this video looking at some very general tips not necessarily related to specific aspects of the game, and the first one is do not put out fires until you are out of danger. This is one of the bigger things that I see less experienced players doing, is as soon as the prompt comes up to fight a fire, they'll immediately hit it and start fighting it. The problem is, if your crew is fighting the fire, your driver's not driving, your gunner's not training the gun on target or shooting, your loader's not reloading your gun, generally speaking, it doesn't do you any good to put out the fire if you just die anyway. So the only time you should really put out a fire if you're not out of danger is if the fire will eventually kill you. This will sometimes happen, like if somebody can just shoot your engine, for example, and they can just do that over and over again. You might as well put out the fire and make it take longer. In that scenario, you kind of need your teammates to help you anyway. Um, the only other scenario is like if you're just completely disabled, they knocked out, you know, breach, engine, and set a fire at the same time, which sometimes happens. In that situation, you might as well put out the fire because you can't fight back. But generally speaking, don't put out the fire as long as you can fight back is a great general rule. Another thing is don't press and hold the repair button to fix your tracks. Your tracks will automatically start repairing. And especially if only one track is disabled, you can still pivot on the other track and potentially get shots at opponents who knocked out your first track. And as soon as you stop moving, the track will instantly start repairing. The only time you should really press and hold to repair tracks is if they also knocked out like engine or transmission and in that scenario you can't move anyway you might as well the next tip is for smoking do not smoke while you can shoot back this is a very simple general rule that a lot of players just do not pay attention to they don't like take it to heart if you can shoot back there is no reason to pop smoke straight up um, I mean, this, this seems very self-explanatory, but I see so many people where you don't knock out the gun, you knock out the engine, and you hide behind a hill, and they pop smoke. Um, I'm not a child, I don't have issues with object permanence, I know where you are, I'm going to kill you. And you'll find the vast majority of opponents will have no problem doing this. Keep your gun up, keep it trained on targets, do your repairs, hope your teammates can help you. Which brings up another point about smoking. Do not smoke while your teammates are nearby and can help you. I see way too many teammates who I am coming up to assist and they pop smoke. And at that point, I can't see anything. So good luck, you know, fare thee well. Um, a lot of opponent, a lot of teammates and opponents will pop smoke when their gun is out, their engine is out, and they're just a target. And popping smoke is the wrong call because you can't do anything actively to get out of that situation. You're in a Jesus take the wheel scenario. The only thing that can help you is your teammates, and popping smoke hurts your teammates' ability to help you. But because you're completely disabled, it doesn't hurt the enemy's ability to kill you. They know where you are, and they've already put a shell into your vehicle. So a lot of, like, you really need to look at the minimap before you pop smoke, or if you have good enough awareness to know that there's no teammates nearby and you might as well, sure, go for it. But you really need awareness of when you're popping smoke, and if you don't have that, just don't pop smoke. Which also brings up another point. Make sure you go into the test drive for a vehicle and figure out exactly how the smoke launcher works because a lot of the smoke launchers work very differently. Some of them are essentially mortars that will fire pretty far out in front of you. Some of them will just kind of drop it in front of you. When you start getting into the higher tier tanks, some of them will fire screens that all detonate like in front of a nice arc. Some even go in like a 360. So always go into the test drive in general. It's a good idea to go into the test drive to see how a vehicle feels, but also to test some of the other systems like smoke and see exactly how they behave. Now one other big thing that I have to tell new players to do, because basically none of them do it, is use your rangefinder. So if you press the rangefinder button, it will you'll see a little green bar will fill. Once it's filled, it will give you a rough estimate of the range. You don't need a rangefinder modification to use the range. All rangefinder modification does is helps it be faster, more accurate. If it's a laser rangefinder, it'll set the range for you, all that good stuff. But you can, you can get the range even if your vehicle has no rangefinder equipped. It's just going to be slower and a little less precise. 
Now, the big thing about the rangefinder is if you see somebody who doesn't see you and you have plenty of time to take that shot, there's no reason to not rangefind because you can guarantee a first hit kill. That's a lot better than going for a ranging shot. So <laughs> it's also, there's a bit of an exploit going on right now. Uh, I hope you didn't turn off crew voices and I'm not sure if this is intentional, but as of the time of recording, the crew voices will call out the type of vehicle and the range before the range finding is actually done. They'll do it almost right away. They'll be like tank tiger range 500 and your range finder still hasn't even finished doing it. You're like, so if you keep an ear out for the crew voices, they will actually call out ranges when you range find to the enemy. So guaranteeing a first hit kill a lot more useful than firing a warning shot because your opponent, they, they can just look back at you and kill you if they know the range or they might even have time to range find depending on how fast your reload is and just land their first hit as a kill. Um, a lot of new players just don't even know range finder exists. They don't understand the feature. They don't use it. You really need to get used to it, especially if you're jumping into like a premium tank near top tier. You need to know how to use that laser range finder. It's kind of a big deal. So a very common thing to hear from less experienced players is the I shot them and did nothing. They shot me and killed me in one hit. And I understand that as a less experienced player, it's not the easiest for you to contextualize what just happened, but that statement really doesn't help me at all. So in order to kind of help you help me and also help you diagnose what's going on, the very first thing you should be doing is you should be looking at the box in the top right corner of the screen when you shoot at an enemy to see what your shell is doing. Cause that'll tell you if your shell bounced, it'll tell you if your shell knocked out critical systems, it'll tell you how many crew the enemy has left. Like you get a bunch of information on this. You also get to see where parts of their tank are or where the internal components are. So for example, see this engagement, we're firing at a mouse. We fire at the vehicle because it wasn't, the mouse has a very big side and I'm always kind of uncertain exactly where the ammo is. But you can see in the x-ray, it shows us where the ammo is. So we just adjust our aim slightly, bottom to the left and next shot detonates the ammo and knocks out the mouse so you can use this to kind of tell where the important parts of the vehicle are in addition to also seeing what you're doing and whether or not your shell is punching through the enemy's armor you can also use this little display to kind of help you determine exactly what the shrapnel patterning on your shell is so for example if you have solid shot you're going to see a cone but if you have say an armor piercing high explosive shell that has a high explosive filler then you're gonna see a nice sphere of damage that's going to do a lot of damage to everything. And this helps you figure out exactly how precisely you need to aim and where you need to figure out individual components are. And this kind of leads into our next point, how do you actually destroy an enemy vehicle? Like once you break through their armor, what is step two? So there are ultimately kind of four ways to destroy an enemy vehicle. The first is to detonate the ammo. And if you're a new player, like I was when I was a new player, you're probably thinking, well, this is what you're going to do because detonating the ammo will automatically destroy the tank. The problem with going for ammo, number one, is that War Thunder uses a real-time ammo model. So as you fire shells, shells will be removed from your tank. The same thing happens for the enemy. Also, if you take less than maximum ammo, then a lot of the parts that ammo would normally be, the ammo is no longer there. So if you take 20 rounds and you've already fired 10, there's only 10 rounds of ammo in the entire tank. So unless you're really familiar with where the vehicle likes to stack the ammo, especially the priority ammo, there's a very good chance the ammo is not going to be there. This also kind of leads into the next point that you should never be taking max ammo, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, the big thing with ammo is that even if you hit it, sometimes the ammo doesn't detonate. Like the ammo can potentially go black, which just means it's no longer available to the enemy player rather than detonating. This combined with the fact that the ammo may not necessarily be there makes shooting for ammo probably one of the least viable tactics outside of vehicles that very specifically have ammo that will always be in certain places. Use an example, the King Tiger has a giant ammo rack in the back of its turret and that's why you'll always see people shooting it because the King Tiger can't not have ammo there. It will always have ammo there and it will always have it very tightly packed. So you're not just hitting one round, you're hitting like two, three, four rounds and the odds that all of them are gonna go black instead of detonating are very low. However, if you look at stuff like Tigers and Panthers, they use like Sponson stowage for their ammo a lot. And the Sponson stowage, depending on how much they take, could be full, could be empty, who knows. So this is part of the reason why if you look at expert players or like really good players showing their gameplay, no, not only are they gonna be constantly looking at the little feed in the top right of the corner and commenting on what's happening, but you'll also see they're aiming for crew, not ammo. And this is where we go into the next win condition. 
if you knock out all of the enemy crew, or if you knock out so much of the enemy crew that the tank can no longer move and shoot, which usually means knocking them down to one, the tank will be destroyed. Enemy crew are always in the same place, and doing damage to them will always have the same result. That is to say, if I shoot the gunner in the face, I always know what's going to happen, the gunner's going to get knocked out. Whereas if I shoot the ammo, could detonate, could not detonate. And this is why you see like better players are going to be commenting, they're counting crew members, or they're looking at shooting at specific crew positions to try and knock out specific crew members in a vehicle. And this is where it's a good idea to kind of get a general feel in the x-ray viewer of various nations tanks to get at least some concept of where they like to keep their driver, where they like to keep their gunner, which are the most active crew members. Which brings us to our next point in like trying to destroy a vehicle through the crew. The driver and gunner will always be replaced after a short window because the tank can't not have a driver and a gunner. So if you see a tank and it comes around the corner and you knock out the driver in the transmission, you can just wait until the driver gets replaced, knock them out again, and you can potentially even kill an entire tank just by shooting the same crew position over and over again, as long as it's a crew position they have to have, like the driver or gunner. Now, exactly how long it takes to replace a crew member, it depends on crew skills and stuff, so it's kind of hard to say, but you get the idea. And this is the reason why most good players are aiming for crew, not ammo. And if you see them comment on screen, They'll often be commenting, you know, gunners out, drivers out, whatever, and they'll act based on that information, right? Like, if I knock out a driver and a gunner, I now know that tank can't move or shoot, so I can just do whatever I want, or I can even just move and ignore them and go on to another vehicle. The third way you can kill an enemy is through using a mechanic called overpressure. Now, overpressure occurs when an explosive effect is powerful enough to hurt the crew even through the hull. And usually this happens with open top vehicles. Any open top vehicle can usually be overpressured even by fairly weak high explosive rounds. And this will basically kill the crew instantly regardless of where you hit them. And this is why it's usually not a bad idea to take a few high explosive rounds, even if your high explosive round isn't generally that useful. Now, if your high explosive round is powerful enough, you can even take out some pretty heavily armored vehicles with overpressure but this really takes some getting used to to get the hang of exactly like what type of vehicle you can take with, take on with what type of shell, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you've got some decent experience under your belt. The next way you can destroy an enemy is by fuel explosions. Now, fuel explosions are way less consistent than everything we've run into so far because it seems to depend on both A, how much damage you're doing to the fuel tank, but also B, the actual skills of the crew, which does mean you should be investing in crew skills, especially if you're a less experienced player. Although it's really hard to say exactly what crew skills do and don't influence the fuel explosion chance. Fuel explosions will destroy a vehicle instantly, but I've had uh, very high skilled crews especially, I basically never have them happen. So they're mostly like a low tier thing, but it does give you an incentive to try and have better crews and make sure you're spending those points. Now, there is kind of another hidden way you can kill enemies that doesn't happen hardly ever, and that is you can use collision damage or even try to drown them by shoving them into water. Collision damage occurs when your tank is a lot heavier than the other tank, and you can just crush something into a wall and potentially do a lot of damage and kill it. However, usually if you're a lot heavier than the enemy, they're a lot more mobile than you, so it's pretty rare that this can happen. But if you do see something like an R3 T20 that's annoying you, uh, slamming it into a wall can definitely result in a kill. Or if you just happen to be on a map with, say, a waterway nearby and you know the enemy's vehicle is not amphibious and you are a lot heavier than them, you can just shove them into the water. But those are very situational and I wouldn't count on it, but you do need to keep in mind and have that in your back pocket in case you see that situation. And all of this obviously leads into the next tip, because as we annotated with ammo, the more ammo you have, the easier it is to cause ammo explosions. And this is on full display against a lot of German teams where Panthers and Tigers will take more ammo than they really need, making it more likely that you'll get those spots and ammo explosions that will just instantly wipe them out. Now, how much ammo you should take heavily depends on the tank and what type of shell you have. Shells that don't do a lot of internal damage if you're taking two to three hits per enemy. I usually take 40 to 60, somewhere in that range. However, shells where I can consistently one-shot, I usually don't take more than maybe 25. 
I will also usually carry a few smoke rounds, a few high explosive rounds, maybe some rounds with higher penetration but worth an internal damage just in case I run into a tougher enemy. But this usually means, and we'll see this throughout some of the sample engagements, that I usually don't take more than about 25 rounds of ammo out from a game. Just because even if I'm having a good game, if I'm one-shotting most enemies or one or two-shotting most enemies, 20 rounds is enough to kill basically the entire enemy team. Now I'm not really going to do a video on shell types because we have a lot of stuff to cover, but to give some basics, if the first two letters are armor piercing, that means it is generally not going to have an explosive effect to overpressure, but it might still have an explosive filler. So if the first two words are armor piercing and then it says high explosive as the next two, that means it'll enter the vehicle and explode, but it still won't overpressure an open top vehicle. However, if the first two words are armor piercing and it doesn't say high explosive, you do want to check the, the damage card for the shells and you kind of need to learn how to read these. So like the top right for the shell is the maximum penetration you can get. It's basically like at point blank range, zero degrees, perfectly perpendicular, how much armor can it go through? And then it'll go through the chart of all the different ranges and angles. And you don't need to memorize all this, but it just gives you a general idea of what the shell can do. It'll also tell you stuff like your muzzle velocity. And then you have the cool little animation that kind of tells you what the shell generally does to the enemy vehicle. You need to learn how to read one of these cards. Like I can't shortcut it for you and tell you what the best shell is for every vehicle in every situation. However, one thing that is very noteworthy is that if it has an explosive filler, it will have an explosive mass stat. So you can tell, uh, I believe some of the American shells do this, where they don't specifically call them armor piercing high explosive, but if you look down at their stat card, it actually has an explosive mass stat telling you that it's high explosive. So that means that while it won't overpressure a vehicle, it will go through the vehicle and then detonate, creating a big sphere of damage. Another thing is the ballistic cap attribute. If you see capped, ballistic cap, whatever, there's a bunch of different ways the game phrases it. This means it's really good at biting into angles. Usually this will be reflected by, if you look at the angled penetration, it will simply show the angle penetration is better, but sometimes like it doesn't necessarily translate as linearly. But if it says ballistic cap, really all that means is that it is better at biting into angles. If the first two words are high explosive, such as high explosive, high explosive anti-tank, high explosive squash head, etc., that means it has an explosive effect and will overpressure open top vehicles. So always look at the first two words of a shell's type because that'll tell you how the game generally treats it. There are a handful of armor piercing rounds that have so much explosive filler that the game considers them to like have an overpressure effect, but those are pretty rare. Most armor-piercing shells do not have an explosive effect at all, at least for the purposes of overpressuring a vehicle. Then you have the question of what shell should you main? What shell you should you use as your primary? And part of this is just going to be reading a stat card because it's going to vary a lot from tank to tank. Usually if a tank has a really good armor-piercing shell that has a high explosive filler, that means that that's going to be your main shell. Um, these shells are very forgiving. You can basically get it anywhere in the crew compartment and knock them out. Additionally, it's very rare that a tank has a good armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo, ABFSDS, or DART as they're called, and have that not be your best shell. 99 times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, the APFSDS is your best shell, or the APHE, depending on which one you have as your best shell. There are a few tanks where this is the exception, but sometimes you get tanks where their top round is like a heat or a, like a rate or armor-piercing, something like that, then it's a little less clear. But at the end of the day, you're just going to have to learn how to read armor piercing stat, the uh, ammo stat cards and understand what the different attributes are because I can't go through on a vehicle by vehicle basis and tell you. Another common thing for new players is on the awareness front, the how did they know I was there kind of question. And there are a lot of indications as to why somebody might know that you are in a specific location. Number one, I mentioned this on a previous video, I'm going to reiterate it. Go into your audio settings. There's a setting for your vehicle and a setting for other vehicles uh, in terms of engine volume. Crank your engine volume way down. You never need to hear your own engine. Crank all other engines way up because hearing other engines is super important, especially if you have directional audio. Most TVs have directional audio. Pretty much all headsets has directional audio. So anything with directional audio, you can tell where somebody is just by engine noises alone. You shouldn't count on that as your only source of awareness, but it can definitely give you an indication that something is in a direction and it's not friendly. 
And of course that leads into the next part, how do you tell if it's not friendly? Well, that's what your minimap is for. You should be glancing at your minimap to have a sense of awareness uh, just about where your team is. Additionally, enemies will be highlighted on that minimap for a few different reasons. One reason is they might get too close to your spawn, then they get highlighted on the minimap. Another reason why enemies will get highlighted on your minimap is if they're scouted by friendlies. But one thing that's really important to note is if an enemy is hit by a friendly by an attack, whether it be plane tank or even just dropping artillery on them, they will briefly be highlighted on the minimap. It's pretty short, but if you do kind of keep one eye on the minimap and look for the red icons, you can spot these and have at least a general idea of where people are. This is also why you'll notice people machine gunning you, even though their machine guns can't hurt you, is they're basically marking you for their team. So that's just something to kind of keep aware of. Additionally, on the minimap, you if you hit and kill somebody, their icon will flash and then it will gray out. So that essentially means that you hit them, so it marked them, but then it also killed them. And lastly, you'll have markers you can get from teammates. They'll mark parts of the map telling you where they think people are. And if you get high enough in battle rating, they can also mark maps from uh, the UAVs. And this is basically just your teammate pinging the map to tell you where they are. Sometimes your teammates are idiots and will mark nothing. But you'd be surprised how often your teammates, like most of your teammates are not trying to mislead you or like send you on a wild goose chase. Most of your teammates are marking where, positions where they think an enemy is. However, these markers are usually not 100% accurate. They're just marking the general area they think the person is. So you have to be a little bit more aware of that it may not be there. It's also important to note that if teammates shoot at aircraft while they're flying over the battlefield, it will mark those, which is a bit of a red herring and you kind of have to note it. Like you'll see a little trail of like exclamation marks going around as your teammates shoot it, but you just kind of have to ignore those. Next thing that you really need to do, and this is something I don't see enough new players doing, check the kill feed. Like just try to keep, don't constantly keep your eyes on it, but just keep one eye on the kill feed as it's rolling by, because this will tell you a few things. Number one, it will tell you how well both teams are doing. If you see a lot of blue on the left and a lot of red on the right, your team is winning. If you see the other way around, your team is not trading as well. You know, the enemy is getting more kills than you are. But it's also interesting because if a teammate dies and you know what vehicle they were in and what their name is, you can look at the kill feed and see what killed them and know how much time you have to go around that corner before the person can reload. So for example, if my teammate gets hit by a shell and I see it's an IS-2 that has a really long reload, I can just immediately peek. On the other hand, if my teammate got hit by a shell and then I see the kill feed and it was something like a Magok Hydra that has backup rockets, it would be a really bad idea for me to round that corner because I'm just going to get smashed by those rockets. So it's important to look at the kill feed, not just to know what killed them and how much time you have, but also to have at least some idea in your brain when you're going around the corner of where you need to be aiming when you go around the corner. And this also brings up another notable feature is you have what's called centering in Call of Duty. Um, this means that your crosshair is aimed where you expect the person to appear. Uh, there's a common practice where players that don't have training doing this will just kind of incidentally look at the floor while they're moving around. And this means they need more time to get their gun on target. And in Call of Duty, this is a big deal, but especially in War Thunder, where you can be one hit killed and some vehicles have pretty poor traverse and elevation, you want to have your gun trained at the point where you expect an enemy to appear from. And this is also how you can kind of get kills on things like urban maps where your opponents, it's relatively flat, your opponent can only really, really appear from around a corner. If you just aim at the corner, your opponent is going to get hit by you before they are in a position to shoot you. So try to practice your centering a bit when you're driving around the map, especially if you're on a lot of the earlier tanks, a lot of the early World War II tanks, something like an M10 GMC, very, very slow turret traverse. You always wanna have your gun pointed pretty close to the right direction because it's gonna take you forever to get your gun on target. And this also kind of brings up another principle you kind of need to get used to turning your turret and hull at the same time to try and get your gun on target faster and understand when you need to do this. Especially at close quarters, but even at longer ranges, even a little twist from your hull can get your gun on target several seconds faster depending on how good your turret traverse is, so it's always a good idea to practice this. Leaping off of that, we have the use of binoculars. Make sure you have a button mapped for the use of binoculars. Uh, you probably do by default, but make sure you're using it. 
binoculars will generally pop up basically right over where the commander's hatch is, so it's usually taller than your tank, or at least as tall as your tank. It can allow you to peek over hills, stuff like that. They're free to use, you can scan the environment quickly, they have a bit of magnification to them. This also does bring up another valid point, uh, hills are kind of overpowered. So if you're next to a hill and you're using the third person camera, you can see over the hill at enemies that can't see you. And you can just wait until the other person has already turned their turret and is driving off in a different direction to pop up and shoot them in the side. Additionally, if you're on a hill, you can appear at any point in that hill, you don't have to appear at the same point. But this also brings up another question in terms of awareness and engagement, limiting the number of angles you can be shot by. And this is one thing that a lot of people do very poorly in this game. Driving up and over a hill exposes you to a lot of fire. So unless you're pretty confident that you are you have good awareness and vision on everybody in that firing arc, you really need to be avoiding doing this. What you need to do is you need to go to the left or right side of the hill. That way you're limiting the shots that you can get get hit by from different angles and like peeking around rather than just going straight over the top because a lot of times you'll see people go straight over the top they might kill you but they also die before they get back over it and at the end of the day that's just a one for one trade it doesn't benefit anybody and stepping off from that my last little point of awareness is you'll probably see when i'm doing gameplay that i'm checking the scoreboard a lot this isn't because I have a big ego and I want to make sure I'm doing awesome. This is actually because the scoreboard has a lot of information on it. It tells you how many deaths everybody has in the lobby. It tells you how many players are currently active on both teams. And if you're at high enough battle rating, it can also tell you if somebody's getting close to a nuke because you can look at their score, look at the amount of deaths they have, you know, the number of spawn points they've used effectively. Do some head math and try to figure out how close they are to getting a nuke and just ending the game, whether they be friendly or enemy. So. You'll probably see me flashing around the scoreboard a lot, and that's basically what I'm doing. Most of the time I'm just looking at which team has the most active players and which team has the most deaths. Because you can have maps where it looks like your team is winning. You're ahead on tickets, you're ahead on points, but then you look at the scoreboard and you see that your team is absolutely getting their butt kicks in these trades. In that scenario, you need to hold points at all costs. You are not going to win on attrition. So it can tell you what you need to be doing on the battlefield. And that's part of the reason why you'll see me constantly just, you know, flash up to the scoreboard for like maybe a second when I don't have anything else to do and then immediately flash back to the game. That wraps up part one of our series. Now we're going to do additional videos in the series, more than one, where we look at sample engagements, take them step by step, and we're going to apply all of the information we just got throughout this video into actual real scenarios that you'll run into in the game of War Thunder and explain to you my thought process and how I'm coming out the other side of these engagements. And I hope you will subscribe just so you don't miss those and I hope you'll stay tuned for the rest of the series. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned something, and I hope you had fun. Have a great day everybody.